This is Tommy Seldor 79. Those of you who follow me on Twitter uh, might have noticed that a few weeks ago uh, we had a quite interesting conversation related to uh, tagging of uh, skates and sharks and in general um, those scientific projects and whether they are um, needed, uh, whether they required and whether the um, cost of um, interacting with those endangered species maybe not outweighs the benefits of the programs. And I even wrote a blog on the back of that. Uh, you can head onto my website uh, tommysoutdoors.com and subscribe uh, by email. I wrote a blog uh, called Angling for Critically Endangered Fish. Um, so anyway, during those uh, conversations I um, I received a quite uh, extensive um, answers or, or maybe contributions from uh, Sea Monitor, from those lovely folks at Sea Monitor project. And uh, obviously, I always try to dig deeper into all those uh, interesting issues. And so today, uh, I am bringing you my conversation with um, Ross McGill, who is a principal project officer for Sea Monitor at Loth's agency and Dr. Fred Wariski who is a executive who is the executive director for Ocean Tracking Network. Uh, and we had an Ocean Tracking Network is kind of um, simplifying a technology provider for Sea Monitor. Um, they operating a whole range of fantastic um, technologies and tags and other ways of monitoring sea wildlife, marine wildlife, and, and um, all the other things that are happening in the oceans. So, uh, very interesting uh, episode, and hopefully it is not uh, the last episode with uh, those lovely people at Sea Monitor. And um, yeah, and just before I let you enjoy this episode of the podcast, uh, just a reminder, in case you're listening to this podcast on uh, one of many podcasting platforms, the video version of this podcast is available on Tommy's Outdoors YouTube channel. Uh, so you can see me and uh, Ross and Fred talking. So head on to YouTube and subscribe to Tommy's Outdoors YouTube channel. Uh, there's not only podcasts there, not only video version of the podcast, but also uh, quite a lot of other outdoors material. And um, yeah, so now without any further ado, after this uh, prolonged introduction, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ross McGill of Sea Monitor and Dr. Fred Wariski from Ocean Tracking Network. Gentlemen, welcome to Tommy's Outdoors. It's great to have you. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, for, well, I first start with uh, introduction and then you might uh, clarify more and, and introduce yourself. So we, with us today is Ross McGill, who is Principal Project Officer at Sea Monitor at Loss Agency. And then Fred War Warowski. Did I, did I get that right? Wariski. Wariski. And you are executive director on Sea Tracking Network. Ocean Tracking Network. Yes, ocean, tracking, ocean Tracking Network, sorry. Uh, is, is that a Polish name? It sounds kind of Polish. Actually Irish. My natural affinity with Ross in the Wexford region. Oh, okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. I, I'm Polish myself, so I always have my ear kind of of all the names that, <laughs> ending with ski and sky. So like, are you Polish? <laughs> okay, lovely. So we're here uh, today, really, because we started that um, a conversation uh, a while back with Ross on Twitter, and it all started with skate tagging and, and discussion around that. And I found about this project, uh, Sea Monitor, and 
Well, it's very interesting, and maybe、um, you guys, you know,、uh, pres- tell me or tell our listeners what that project is about, and what what is that?、Uh, what is Project Monitor, and what you do, and what is the role of、uh, Ocean Tracking Network in in that whole project? You well, go I can go. Yeah, I can. I can give a brief overview and let Fred take over、um, on a lot of the.、Uh... Uh, equipment that we're going to be using,、uh, some descriptions、mm-hmm. and how it's applied, but essentially, Sea Monitor is a marine research project、um, that is very collaborative in its nature.、Um, there's nine partners、um, spanning a couple continents,、um, and this sort of region that we're looking at,、um, north and south of the island, and western Scotland primarily.、Mm-hmm. Um, it. It's been a long time in the making. Fred was involved long before my time. I was hired as essentially project manager.、Um, but what、uh, Sea Monitor aims to do is answer some of the questions.、Uh, hopefully, start to answer some of the questions, the unknowns in our regional seas about、uh, mobile marine fauna.、Um, I think at its heart of it, it's an Atlantic salmon project with、um, other species that were added on later. Um, oh. And now it reaches up to、uh, five species or types of animals. We have Atlantic salmon. We have、uh, cetaceans. We have porpoise, whales, that sort of thing. Cetaceans.、Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got flapper skate, as you mentioned,、uh, mm-hmm. picked up on.、Uh, it all、seals. started. It all started from flapper skate, I think. <laughs> But our conversation, yeah, picked up from Shark Week, and 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 yeah, and always always a popular time of the year for people to get interested in science, I suppose. And basking sharks is another species、mm-hmm. that we're looking at.、Um, and Fred will go on and talk about. The work he's done in his career and, and、mm-hmm. how Ocean Tracking Network got involved, the, primarily the technology being used,、um, not for the first time in these waters and in, in the regional waters, but、uh, to this scale, it's the first time that、uh, acoustic telemetry has been used like this.、Mm-hmm. Um, if you think about it, I guess it's like a, a very large fish counter that we're putting out with、uh, species that are tagged and then recorded.、Um, What it allows us to do, and what the project hopes to do, I suppose, is、um, come up with、uh, spatial distribution mapping to find out、yeah. how these species move. So, for example, if you take a、uh, look at salmon, you, your previous episodes have covered salmon before in、mm-hmm. great detail. The pressures they face and and、yeah. all those challenges, right? We know a lot about how they 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 move in and out of the freshwater environment and what can be done to to alleviate those pressures and to help the species and protect them. A lot less is known about the marine environment,、uh, their migration out to sea, their survival rates and stuff. And so, this project, one of the the sort of I don't know what you want to call it, the 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 jewels in the crown or the the key sort of you know headline grabbing thing is that we're going to deploy what will be Europe's largest marine array between Malin Head, Republic of Ireland, and Isla, Scotland,、mm-hmm. some sixty odd kilometers long. So it'll be a very large. Array of these counters that will pick up detections of species like salmon as they、mm-hmm. migrate back and forth, and hopefully give us a better understanding of the pressures that the species、uh, face, where they are in that migration path, so that we can better improve、um, the management and protection of them.、Um, mm-hmm. What I mean by that, I guess, is、um, research projects. You know, do a good job at gathering data and、mm-hmm. and using that data to paint better pictures of things. But it's the key in this project, I suppose, is maybe for one of the first times we are working directly with the policymakers in creating management plans, things that will inform management plans,、um, and directly impact on on policies. Maybe creating marine protection areas if that's necessary、mm-hmm. um, for those species that I mentioned. So it's it's incredibly exciting stuff.、Um, It's it's and as I say, the the scale of it, both in terms of the equipment we're putting out, the the type of activities and 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 field work that's taking place, but also you know just the fact that it's such a large group of scientists working collaboratively、mm. on such a big project. So you've got you've got Fred and his team in Canada, we've got PhD students in California,、um, we have、um, uh, partners Galway Mayo Institute of Technology, we've got the Marine Institute down in Galway. We have ourselves the Locks Agency, which is a unique cross-border protection and scientific agency, as you know.、Mm-hmm. Um, we've got the. Can you can you explain that? Can you explain that to to our listeners who might not be aware about Locks Agency?、Uh, about the Locks Agency, yeah.、Um, so the, I mean, the Locks Agency、uh, started back in the fifties,、um, but it wasn't called the Locks Agency then. It was called the Locks Agency from nineteen ninety eight. 
Mm -hmm. um, and it was formed as part of the Good Friday Agreement uh, because when all these things, when, you know, the peace uh, process was taking place, they were deciding on how all these different things could be managed, these areas, mm -hmm. these border areas. And so it wasn't just the land borders they were looking at, but also the water borders. Um, so the LOX agency was created and set up to sort of look after the protection and the management of Carlingford and the foil catchment areas, mm -hmm. north and south. So it's a north-south um, arms link government body, essentially. And it serves different purposes, primarily two purposes, protection, that is like IFI in the south, you know, um, enforcement, protecting from poaching and illegal activities. But it also serves as a monitoring scientific role. Mm -hmm. um, and so when it comes to something, a species like Atlantic salmon, it would maintain counters, uh, would maintain a uh, body of uh, fisheries officers that go out um, similar to IFI in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but again, unique in that it's a cross-border, um, multi-jurisdictional uh, area. Gotcha. Um, and, it, you know, foil catchment area alone is over 2,000 square kilometers large. It's mm -hmm. quite a big area to cover, as you can, you can sort of imagine. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things the project hopes to do is inform, for example, uh, the creation of a, of a marine management plan for salmon in the foil catchment area as well as in the Clyde catchment area in Scotland. Another one of our partners is Glasgow University. Mm -hmm. um, so different partners come at it with different um, backgrounds and different uh, fields of specialty. Mm -hmm. And they each take a different species, if you were. And, you know, uh, for example, Glasgow, as I mentioned, is looking at Atlantic salmon along with the agency um, for a management plan in the Clyde. Uh, the other partners that are looking at salmon are AFBI, Agri-Food and Bioscience Institute, based mm. in Belfast. Um, they're looking at uh, salmon migration uh, research around the Bush River, north coast of Northern Ireland. And you've got the Marine Institute as well as another salmon partner. Mm -hmm. um, you've got the University College Cork, down near where you are, Tommy. Mm -hmm. um, they're focusing on harbor seals. So mm -hmm. that's a really interesting sort of subsect of the project that exists kind of independently from yeah. some of the other work. Yeah. Um, they're tagging for the first time um, in Ireland uh, juvenile mm -hmm. uh, harbor seals. And is, been it, is, it, is it only harbor seals or gray seals? Just, seal just as well? harbor seals in this particular instance. They're looking at yeah. Uh, there's a there's a, a an aquarium in Portaferry, Northern Ireland, that yeah. as part of its work, it's funded to do is to uh, uh, re take root seals that have been injured or, or separated yeah. from their parents, whether through human activity or natural. Mm -hmm. And because those are protected, they, they have an onus to uh, to rehabilitate them and try and release them back into the wild. Mm -hmm. But they've never been they've never been tagged or tracked with any of these technologies. Yeah. Um, to see where they go and what they and some of the we've so far they've tagged six uh, seals and mm -hmm. some of the data coming back from that little part of the project is incredibly interesting. Like you wouldn't yeah. think a juvenile seal would travel all the way across the Irish Sea to Wales and <laughs> haul out in whales and start feeding around there or, or some of the dives of 150, 160 meters deep <laughs> at, at a juvenile stage is incredible. So they're starting to get a more accurate picture of how they get on in the wild. Um, and again, it's all about how to better protect and manage the species going forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I, I think there's maybe a lost opportunity that you're, you are, or Cork University doesn't track a gray seals. Because this is something that was coming up on the podcast many times, uh, and there's always these questions: like how many of these seals we have, and you know, are they protected? Are they not protected? And there's like a one yeah. of the one of the subjects of uh, that was mentioned on the podcast, and I think was was will will be mentioned just in the episode before this one is the human seal conflict. That's uh, there's like a, another big area, so. Maybe, maybe well, they think, can include gray seals as well. <laughs> yeah, I don't, for this project, no. But for, for other projects, I know, and, and we can put you in touch with them if you want to pick that up. But definitely, oh, absolutely. They, have, they have looked at gray seal populations and they have studied them. Um, so okay. maybe not as part of this project, but I know that they, mm -hmm. they do that as part of other work. So yeah, it's an important aspect. Absolutely. So absolutely. Um, yeah, it's quite, it's quite a diverse project, Tommy. I mean, we, we've the other thing I, 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 I enjoy working with um, everybody, and we've, we've got different countries are represented in terms of the scientists that have been recruited and are part of the project. Majority of the scientists working on the project are women, which shows a, the trend in, in marine biology. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's just, it's been, it's been amazing for me. Every day is a school day because I'm not a scientist by trade. I'm mm -hmm. just a project manager who's worked on mm -hmm. these EU projects before in different 
different uh, different uh, sectors. Mm -hmm. So to come to this project has been eye opening and incredible. Um, I can I imagine fortunate, that. You know, I can imagine that. That's, uh, that sounds that sounds fantastic, um, Fred. So um, do you have anything to add to what what Ross said? And and then maybe you can jump in and say like, what is the role of uh, of an ocean tracking network in this project? Sure. So the, the big picture that Ross was discussing is the fact that animals in the ocean can't meet all of their needs in one place. They've got to move. They've got to go from point A to point B to find food, to find mates, to, to do all these interesting things that they need to happen. So what the Sea Monitor Project is about is trying to document those movements, because if we block them, then all of a sudden fisheries disappear and the communities that are getting the benefits from fisheries are no longer getting them before. And we can block them in a variety of ways. Offshore developments, wind farms has been a, a big consideration in a lot of these kinds of issues. Sonic mm -hmm. uh, exploration can, can drive animals away from certain places where they have been before. So all of those human impacts yeah. are things that we need to manage in the future. And to manage them, we need to know where the animals are. Mm -hmm. We also want to know about the habitats they're using. So where do they go? Do they, when they're moving, do they stop for a while in certain places? And why are they stopping there? Is it because it's a shelter from predators or is it a great place that's got lots of food to, mm -hmm. to keep them and let them bulk up and, and do these things? And for example, are some of these areas marine protected areas? So are the marine protected areas actually areas where the animals are stopping in and being protected or are they ignoring them or passing through them very mm -hmm. rapidly? providing minimal protection. So all of those are questions that we are trying to answer. Problem with the ocean and animals is that they're very comfortable in it and we as humans are not. And we are not very good at following them and, and knowing what's going on, which is why we've reverted to these electronic tagging systems that Ross was referring to in these electronic counting systems to try to count the movements of these animals as they're moving from different places and try to figure out what's going on when they move from point A to point B and what happened in between to them. So we, what we do is we put these acoustic tags on mm -hmm. the animals, or in some cases inside the animals, a little surgery that surgery that's underway, and then we sew it inside the animal. Oh. And the tags can last, depending on the size of the tags, up to 10 years. So the tags we use for white sharks down in our area are, are good for 10, and in some cases with special programming for 20 years. So we can follow how that animal individual's behavior changes as it goes from being a a young animal to a sub-adult sub animal to the point that it's a full-grown uh, predator moving in different places. And that tells us a lot about how these animals are, are changing as they get older. So um, the, go the goal of the Sea Monitor Project is to, as Ross pointed out, put out a, a large line and unite European researchers to, to get to the point that we can answer some pretty critical questions about a variety of different species that are moving in these areas. Not all of them are acoustically tagged. The marine mammals that he was referring to are being followed through a couple of different technologies. Some of them have satellite tags. Um, the great beauty of, of seals is that they come out of the water to breathe. And when they do come out of the water, um, they can communicate with a satellite if you've got a radio system attached. Yeah. Thing that will come out of the water. So we glue these radio satellite tags on their heads, and when they pop up, they lock onto a satellite. And we very quickly get a GPS position. We know where it's been and how it's. Are going. you are you literally gluing them in on their head? Yep. Yeah. Ah. So the, uh, and one of the keys to the Sea Monitor project, and one of the reasons they're focusing in on the harbor seals, is part of what they're doing is evaluating the restoration strategy. So these are our rec uh, rescue animals that have been found. Mm -hmm injured or, or sick on the beaches. They're being brought back to life through the care of a variety of veterinarians and volunteer groups that have been looking after them. Then they're released back to the wild as part of the conservation strategies for these animals. And it's good to know what do they do afterwards. And as Ross pointed out, some fascinating results surrounding how they're behaving as juveniles, what they're learning as they're getting out into the ocean, how they're teaching themselves, what I have to do to survive, including diving down to very great depths and heading over to whales. To, oh. to what the Welsh had to offer in terms of a uh, smorgasbord. It's, it's so fascinating. fascinating. So all of those are part of the, the, the game. But mm -hmm. ocean research tends to be expensive, and the infrastructure is complex, and it does require specialized equipment to put it out. Mm 
So by forming this network, what we've been able to do is tap into a lot of expertise and resources from these different groups to enable us to do things. So mm -hmm. the EU has provided the funding that has enabled us to buy a lot of the acoustic receiver equipment that will listen for these tagged animals in the areas. Um, various partners are providing things like ship times or, or labor of crews to, to get animals tagged to go out and do these things. And by bringing all of those pieces together, suddenly the effort becomes much larger than the sum of the individual parts. And we can begin to look at the, the integration of, well, what are the skates and the salmon doing that are different? But what are they doing that's the same? What does that tell us about how productivity cycles in the ocean are turning on or turning off in those particular areas, or maybe about some of the predators that are around at the time and how they both respond to those. Yeah. So that's the, and we, the Ocean Tracking Network based out of Canada is really about promoting these kinds of infrastructures. Um, I'm funded by an agency called the Canada Foundation for Innovation mm -hmm. to develop a global infrastructure. Um, this is the contribution that Canada is making to ocean research. Many, many different countries are carving out what they have to contribute to the ocean. And one of the places where Canada is very good is in these technologies. So developing the acoustic telemetry receivers, developing the tags, developing scientists that know how to do this stuff. So Canada has made the decision that they will contribute to this on a global basis and especially contribute to trying to bind investigators up into networks and provide data systems so that we can freely exchange information about somebody to tag, detects tagged animals that you didn't expect to see in places where they didn't know yeah. that they were going to be. So, for example, I've got blue sharks that I tag here off in Nova Scotia that are cropping up in the Azores. <laughs> so they cross the Atlantic Ocean, which is great. Um, what we need to know, though, what we need to do is have a way to exchange the fact that my tag with its identity is in the data systems that they have in the Azores so that they know who it belongs to as opposed it's to, oh, just a mystery. We know we had a tag here, but no idea what it is. And that's the end of the story. Well, we yeah. all lose under those circumstances. We don't yeah. benefit from the, the ability to, to understand all of this. So binding everything together by a data system is a really, really important component of that. And that's one place where we are making a big contribution. Right, that's right. F fantastic. So I, I have a, a lot of questions. So first, first off, um, it's fantastic that you try and kind of tie all the data sources and all the information, like you mentioned, tags and like, oh, who, who this tags belongs to. So um, those tags that uh, IFI is, is we're, we're tagging uh, skates and sharks in Ireland, are they also part of this project or, or they're not included? No, there's, multi as Fred alluded to, there's um, other projects happening around these regional waters. Some are EU funded like ours, and yeah. some may be funded by the, the companies or the, the, uh, the agencies themselves. But the, the tracking network that Fred spoke about mm -hmm. allows you to, if, if, for example, you have a receiver out in the water and it picks up a tag mm -hmm. from another project, the tags have IDs on them, and Fred can explain yeah. how it works. But basically, there's a, a way to sort of track the tag back and, and share the data. So it's not, they're not done in self in, in, in splendid isolation that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all based on, on the, on the uh, network and the telemetry that, that, that Fred is talked about and will be talking about. You're not relying well, on the recapturing the animals because, you know, one of, one of the things uh, that was like, Oh, we have these projects, right? And we're capturing animals and then we're recapturing animals or we, or we tag the animal, but then we rely on commercial fishing vessels to, to recapture the animal. And then, yeah. you know, that animal is dead already. So you're asking like, well, what was the point actually to tagging it in the first place if you're relying on it, that animal being dead and so on and so forth. So you are not relying on recapturing the animals as I understand for, for this project. It's, it's all no. electronic. No, and as Fred said, that there's different battery lives and different types of tags mm. for, the, for the particular species. Some of them, like the cetacean monitoring that we're doing, uses no tags at all. It's passive acoustics. And that's right. just, that's literally putting out different types of, of monitors, recorders in different parts of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And it, it's amazing that technology, and they can pick up the different types of whale song, porpoise clicks, the ambient noise levels and everything. So there's no tags involved at all. And, and Fred wow. has established a, an amazing network around uh, the Canadian waters to uh -huh. protect right whales and other species using passive acoustics. Um, gliders, these autonomous um, underwater vehicles, 
uh, or another technology that the project will utilize wow. even more incredible, like basically, you know, unpiloted submarines, little mini mm -hmm. submarines that go out, out to the shelf edge. They can pick up tagged salmon. If tagged salmon go by them, they can pick up whale song and, and mm -hmm. other cetacean noises. Um, it, it is incredible sort of NASA level stuff as it was described once to me. What's your view? So before before we jump into the more details on, on how this technology works, like what is your view on on these, let's say, old school ways of tracking and monitoring animals? Like I mentioned, you know, fishing vessel or anglers are catching fish, putting tag in the fin, release the fish, and then someone else recaptures the thing. Is is your view like this is really pointless and, and, and poses some, you know, animal welfare issues? Or, or do you think that this has a future or is it like, oh, that's an old way of doing things and you think this is something that will be phased out? How, how, how do you view those, those old school ways of tracking animals? I don't know, Fred, do you want to come in on this one? Because I can, I can uh, go first if you want, Ross, yeah. and you can uh, type in again. So covering the ocean is a really difficult problem. Even with the acoustic receiver network that I have out there now, there's still some pretty gap, big gaps and things. And one technology alone is not good enough on its own to tell us the whole story and give us the detail that we need for management purposes on these animals. So mm -hmm. um, the old school ways, the, the putting an external tag on an animal, recapturing it, it's still providing valuable data. It's also providing long-term data so that some of these programs for example, there's a shark tagging program that mm -hmm. the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration has been running for 40 years in the United States. That goes on. It's using the same methods year after year, picking up animals, documenting their, their movements. What it's picking up is the signal of how the ocean is changing now mm -hmm. and how that suddenly we're, we're not getting the same patterns of returns as we did before. And this is telling us that something is something big is happening out there and it's going to have consequences that we don't understand. So we don't cut the uh, cut the lines to all of these things. They're all providing varying levels of information. But the beauty of the acoustic tags is once the animal is in there and out and running, you don't have to recapture it again. And we get yeah. a lot more recaptures of these animals. So, so from an animal welfare perspective, um, we have to work with many fewer animals to get the same answers to the okay. questions that we're asking than you do when you're working with these other kinds of tags that are dependent on a, a low probability of, of recapture of them yeah. in fisheries that are afterwards. So from that perspective, it does benefit. Yeah, 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 for sure. But do you, do you think those methods are going to be like phased out and they, they you know, over, like as you, if you're, if you, would you say that this is one of the indicators of, of your success of the, you know, the technologies that you're using that ultimately you would like to see all those other methods to be phased out and, and no. No, no. Um, phasing out other methods is not one of my indicators of success. We are not make, we are not attacking anybody. We're not trying to replace anybody. We're trying to come up with the best methods in order mm -hmm. to answer the questions that, as a society, we have decided that we need to, to have answered. And sure. in many of these projects, acoustic telemetry is, is definitely one of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I, don't see any, I don't see them being replaced, a lot of these traditional methods, for a very long time yet. Mm -hmm. And there, there are some places where it works really, really well. For example, within a closed lake system where an animal is not migrating except within that particular yeah. lake system, an external tag like that where you can follow an animal year after year after year works very effectively. And the difference is it costs me $360 a tag for the acoustic tags and it costs less than a dollar for one of these external tags. Mm. So you can, you can tag a lot more animals for a lot less money and that's part of the, the game as well. Yeah, I thought I was th I was thinking that the cost is is might be a benefit here. Mm. And when it comes to, I mean, some, as Fred said, it's one of, of many tools, and you have to use the right mm -hmm. tool for the job type of thing. When it comes mm -hmm. to flapper skate, for example, so little is known. And if you were to look at the the range of species we're we're researching this project, they're mm -hmm. probably the most critically endangered. Yeah. They're probably the least known, both in the public and maybe even the scientific community's eyes. Um, there's some scientists that have studied flapper skate their whole lives and have never seen one in the wild. <laughs> you know, they, they never, they've never seen one live. It's only been on a, on an autopsy table or something. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so you, you have to work with fishermen and local anglers who know where they are and, and encourage them to use best welfare practices if they do land them and, and tag them for you and stuff like that. Because just getting a hold of one is, a, is, a, is an operation in itself, mm-hmm. let alone finding out all the questions you want to answer. They don't yeah. even know if they're, if they're strictly residential populations or if they cross the channel and there's you know, yeah. genetic relations to the, the flapperscape population in Scotland. You know, that's a mm-hmm. question that we're hoping to start to answer. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it's... As Fred says, it's a very large ocean out there, very diverse. Yeah. And, and you know, this is still unanswered. This is this is fantastic because I've been in a, in in many discussions over uh mainly, you know, from where I'm sitting uh where where capture by anglers, by recreation anglers, capture occurs of a of a endangers a rare species, six gill shark or or skate or flapper skate or something like that. And then you have this discussion like, oh, why anglers are targeting them, they should leave them alone and so on. And then we go, oh yeah, but we tagging them and we contributing to, to these things. And then, but they are endangered. No, they're not endangered, they data deficient. And it seems that's quite often like this, if the animal is uh, data deficient, it's like, all right, it's good, it's, it's good to go. It's not endangered. And like you point out, it's like, oh, we actually have no idea. Data deficient means that we have no idea. It may be the very last one that you caught in the area. And that's a, that's a that's a problematic thing. Well, I mean, and we're already starting to get results in. Um, mm-hmm. We, like I say, we started just last year, and it takes you about a year to get going and get everything uh, up and running. Lox Agency is the lead partner on this project, um, with the others, as I say, playing their yeah. respective roles in in the species. But we've already started to get, as I say, data back on the seals, which is incredibly encouraging and interesting. Mm-hmm. And uh, although COVID, the pandemic's restricted, obviously, what we can do in terms of mm. field work, uh, there has been receivers deployed in uh, the foil estuary area, the bush estuary area, um, the Clyde, and we got some receivers out in the middle of the channel, but not the whole, the whole yeah. array, the whole string. Yeah. And already we're starting to see uh, some detections, uh, individual detections of salmon smolts that have been released from different river systems in the marine environment for the first time. Uh, yeah. So scientifically, it's it's starting to happen. It's starting, yeah. the, the data is starting to come in and, and it's quite encouraging. And, and some, you know, theories maybe potentially leading to more head scratching than uh, confirmation mm-hmm. of theories. You know, there's been some detections of fish, well, possible detections, I say, because they still need to be analyzed and, and mm-hmm. validated. But, you know, it's it may not always be the case that the smolts head directly out up north. They might, hang around the channel or be pushed around the tides and go back and forth yeah. before yeah. they head out. So there, there's more questions always that are raised with these projects. Before I jump in into, into more detailed questions about tagging, um, you mentioned at the, at, the, at, the, at the beginning that you were working with policymakers. Can you can you elaborate a little bit more? Like, what does it mean? Does it mean because then you know when I'm coming f- is from the perspective that again one one thing that is often mentioned like oh, you know we have this scientific project we gather all this data, and then so what? You know what nothing you nothing nothing changes. So can you elaborate? Is is that involvement uh, kind of include some sort of a commitment if? to you know either establish marine protected areas or uh change the you know the regulations here i say for recreational anglers or maybe for commercial sector or is it more like yeah we're there we kind of you know maybe supporting you morally or financially but there's well, no commitment I, I think at the heart of this project it's about good research and science meets what will hopefully become good policy and translate it into some sort of meaningful action or could be legislative. It could be, there's a whole host of things available Mm -hmm. to policymakers to choose from. Um, Good scientists simply tell you what the science is showing and what the different things you could be doing, but they're not lawmakers and they're not policymakers. And so I think that was a recognition from the the EU interreg um, people, as well as um, the government departments, North and South. So we have, you know, none of these projects happen in splendid isolation in just an academic bubble. They happen because there's interest from the policymakers, Mm -hmm. the government departments that are responsible for the marine environment in this case. Um, In the north, it's the Department for Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs, DIRA. 
-hmm. And in the south, uh, your neck of the woods, it's uh, the Department for Housing, Local Government, and Planning. Which, yes. has a, which has a marine protection uh, realm. Yeah, it's, it's just a recent change that yeah, yeah, landed the with changes. housing, which <laughs> says a lot. Yes, um, but so so they have representatives on our board, and they they take a keen interest in the in the, the data and the science that's coming out of the projects, and then they want to hear from the scientists what options are available, or what they are thinking is some of the things to to help alleviate the pressures and protect the species better. And it's not a prescriptive approach. It's not like this project is going to, we know what we're going to say at the end of it. We just mm -hmm. know that we hope to have this amount of data and new information. And these are the range of things that could happen as a result of the project. So one, one example, just to highlight something that was brought to the attention was Queens University are looking at basking sharks. Mm -hmm. As Fred says, a very highly mobile species. They've been tagged and they've been found in, off the coast of Massachusetts, they cross the globe basically, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there, you couldn't, you wouldn't want to put in a, a, a fixed 24/7, 365 day a year marine protection area off the coast of Malin necessarily for no vessels to go through all year round because of basking sharks because they're not there all year. Yeah. So that the, the <laughs> instances of strikes are going to be quite low, or chances of that in the winter, right, or certain months of the year even when they're supposed to be there, we don't see them that often. So they're, mm -hmm. they're incredibly elusive and they come and go with plankton blooms and all the rest. So what this data may, what this project may end up coming up with is a more dynamic way of, of doing that where you have like a weather alert system on your app phone mm -hmm. or something like that that's created that could warn you certain times of the year, certain uh, periods would be more likely for strikes and fishermen and recreational vehicles should slow down or stay out of these areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a small example. Yeah, those are the sort of thing. And Fred, you know, Fred can go on about the technology that's been applied in Canada the same way. You know, I, I would plunge in here with just one comment. And you raised this sure. earlier, Tommy, when you were talking about the you know, deficient species and about whether you should or should not tag them. Um, we have a lot of policy tools. We have management tools that are available if you know what it is that you have to manage, if you know what's going on. So the tool can be applied. And in a data deficient species, they can't be applied because you don't know what's, what's going on. Ergo, there's a, there's a trap there. And that's what we're trying to fill. And in much of what Ross is describing, the work that's underway and the, the rest of the work that others are doing is moving to try to correct this, to, to take away the data deficiencies and give us the tools that we need. And it can't happen too soon, in my opinion, yeah. as we look at things like the blue growth agenda, we say that they, the next frontier for economic development for human society is going to be the oceans. Let's get out there, boys, and start, start oh. putting everything in place to do this. And maybe we can do it all without harming anything else if we know what are the needs of these animals? Where are the places that they need to be? How do they need to be there now? So we got to get there ahead of this blue revolution that's coming and yeah. get this information into place. Yeah, that didn't, that didn't say like my immediate thought was like, oh, that doesn't sound good. It, it just like, sounds like more pressure to those animals and, and all that. So you're right. You're right. It's very important to have that, to have that information. Um, guys, was, was there any um, level of disappointment then with work with the uh, like governmental bodies and policymakers? I mean, you know, we all know about, for example, fishing quotas that are you know, repeatedly set way above the scientific level. So is there a part of you that, you know, needs to fight internally this thing? Like we have all this information, we gather all this data and there's all this excitement. And then you, you put that out to, to make a policy to protect the species, to protect the fishery, to protect the local economy. And then some political agenda takes, takes over and essentially that data is not used. Is, is, is there a, part of you that is kind of disappointed with with that i can plunge in first to ross if you want um here yeah. on the canadian side we had a very famous case of this it was called the northern cod yes uh, collapse. please can you can you lay it out for for our listeners i would love to hear that from you well the uh the bottom line was that we we ignored the indications basically continued because of a variety of, of reasons and there were technical problems for example one of the things that changed was 
We had independent monitoring by our, our Department of Fisheries and Oceans, which was costly to do this, where they would go out and they sample random areas and see how many cod were there and how much area were they occupying. A decision was taken to stop that and to just depend on fisheries catches because mm -hmm. there seemed to be a very good correlation between the size of the fisheries catches and the monitoring program suggesting how big the stocks were at the time. But what changed once they made that decision was the ability of the fishing community, the harvesters, to find the fish because you had new echo sounders developing, better fish finders. So the catches stayed artificially high while the numbers of fish were contracting and the space that they were operating were contracting to the point that we finally came up to this collapse. So these kinds of things can happen when you don't maintain your appropriate monitoring. The bottom line there was that in ignoring the signs and not taking action, we are more than 20 years into a cod fishing moratorium here and we still haven't managed to rebuild these particular stocks. It was a billion dollars a year that this was generating in terms of revenues. It was coastal communities that were dependent on them that were devastated by by all of these kinds of things and that's what you get into if you don't have the information don't provide the monitoring don't provide the information so hopefully here we have learned our lesson forever from that mm -hmm. one particular disastrous event and we're not doing that anymore on this side and yeah. oh, I, I hope europe has not got a similar collapse story in and of it, itself and never does sort of yeah. end up quite uh, to that kind of a deep hole. But but I think the understanding is there is we don't want to be in those kinds of holes. Ab absolutely. And, and, you know, like, again, this is something that on the podcast, I said many times that, you know, if you want to look at the model of managing wildlife and, and protecting animals, then, you know, other side of Atlantic, uh, US and Canada are places where, where we really should look up to because these, these programs seem to be very effective, at least mature maybe through the um, issues like you mentioned, like the cod stocks collapse or, or things that are happening with Buffalo in, in the US. But, and Ross, I, I guess this is, you know, since I'm referring now to the European, like like year after year, I, I read in, in newspapers, you know, like the fish stocks are again, you know, ignore all the scientific advice and their, you know, fishing quotas above this and that. And then fishermen say, that, oh yeah, fish is leaping out of the water, which is Fred, what you said, like they probably increasing the capability of catching fish and they still think, oh, there's a plenty of fish here. So is is do you do you have any hopes that that now with engaging such advanced technology and having this project with so many stakeholders you can kind of uh, make a positive change? Yeah, and I don't think it's misplaced optimism to think that um, we have had no indication from the government bodies we work with um, now. Admittedly, we're not talking to the highest levels. We're we're at the this is the policy making sort of sections of these these mm -hmm. departments, but they seem um, very optimistic or they're willing to work with us. And this was in some cases they actually asked the project to amend itself to help oh. them inform the harbor seals as an example. Wow, where cork studies gray seals as as we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. um, and they wanted to continue to do that as part of this project. The funder actually said, well we have this bit of work going on up here in Northern Ireland that hasn't been studied yet. Could you actually turn your attention to this and use your expertise and the technology to help inform whether or not we should continue to fund this or adapt the mm -hmm. program better, make it better. This is a small example of how it's been, it, it's been not driven just solely by the scientists and their, yeah. what they don't know and what they want to learn. It's also delivered, uh, been driven by the policymakers. Okay. Um, so, you know, and, and, and because it's not just us reporting to them at the end and saying, here you go, it's it's a back and forth along the way with mm -hmm. conferences and, and, and transfer knowledge transfer conferences, as they call them, planned along the way to help tell them at what stages we're at, where we need help, what's what's emerging. Mm -hmm. That is encouraging to me um, yeah. because we live in, you know, the region is, is very dynamic. You have, um, it's multi-jurisdictional. Yeah. Whereas the environment yeah. Fred works in, correct me if I'm wrong, Fred, it, you have a border with the United States to the south of you. That's pretty much it. You know, whereas in here you've got Scotland, Ireland, um, yeah. and the UK and, and Northern Ireland and the whole, you know, political dynamic and Brexit mm. as well. Yes. Um, yes. So it's, it's, uh, it's encouraging that this is happening on that because the species don't know about political borders, yeah. obviously. They, yeah. and, and 
they don't know they're transitioning into another <laughs> management area where they're not, or area where they're not protected. <laughs> so you care. have to, you have to create the, yeah, they don't care. <laughs> Generally they don't care. Yeah. So you have to see these things from the eyes of what's best for the, the, mm -hmm. the species, but also taking into consideration the impact that decisions will have on the human side yeah. and the economics. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, guys, uh, let's switch gear now and uh, gears right, now. And thing, Tommy, yeah, we sure. Talk, um, you did raise the issue of decisions being made based on the best available science. And mm -hmm. it is a legitimate mm -hmm. question to sit back and say, how good is the best available science? There have been a number of cases where commercial fishermen have said there are lots of animals. and People have said that the best available science says no, and it turns out that the best available science wasn't very good. They were not actually doing the sampling. They were not documenting how many animals here. We had a famous case of scallop fishing in the Massachusetts region where they, fisheries were closed because they, they said that their indicators had showed that there were no scallops, and the fishermen mounted a science program that went out and actually did the work and showed that they were way off with the assessment. Huh. So what, what it boils down to is, is we got to get the science up there with the quality that's needed to make the kinds of decisions that we're making. And, and these new technologies are helping us punch up our game and get to the mm -hmm. point that we are getting new information and, and better descriptors of what's going on in the environment. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, so like I said, uh, now I want to switch the gears and start talking about actual tags and actual technology. So um, where to start? I suppose that the question that I have is, is how the tagging, because uh, you mentioned that some of the te techniques doesn't even require tagging, and, and we're going to talk about that. But firstly, the ones that are requiring tagging, how, how the tagging works. So do you have special groups of people tasked with going and tagging, or do you rely on, you know, uh, like we refer boots on the ground, anglers and fishermen who are catching fish, and then they can, you know, enroll to a program to, to put a tag on a, on, a, on a particular species of fish, maybe not anglers, but, uh, you know, skippers or, or something like that. But then obviously they're not going to do a little surgery, like you mentioned on some species. So how does that work? Do you, do you have people to go, you go out there and now we're going to tag as much as, as many animals as possible, or, or how does it work? I can just give a very brief overview of it, and Fred will elaborate on the details. But it's sure. it's a different different methodologies for the species. Um, mm -hmm. Let's start with salmon. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not tagging far and wide because, as Fred said, the expense of tags is quite high. The project is four point six million euro, which sounds like a lot of investment, but it's actually not. Mm -hmm. um, it affords us about. In the case of the foil catchment area, which is, as I say is uh, many different rivers, about 2,000 square kilometers, we actually only have in the salmon element of the project for the foil about 50 to 100 tags per season that go out. Mm -hmm. And so what we've decided to do is focus on a few index rivers in the foil catchment area mm -hmm. um, that will give us the best you know, results where we can act with the availability of smolts is there every season. Um, Bush, Clyde, and uh, Glasgow, they're the similar sort of a bit more tagging. Um, the seals are GPS. As Fred said, they're not um, surgically implanted into the uh, mm -hmm. seal. They are glued on and then just naturally fall off uh, when the seal molts as they get older. Mm -hmm. So there's no distress or anything caused to the seal or any implications there. Um, passive acoustics is for the cetaceans, no tagging. Uh, basking sharks is sort of a clamp that goes on the dorsal fin. So you actually have to go out on a small rib boat or something when the sharks are at the surface, mm -hmm. clamps on and falls off naturally eventually or pops back up. Um, what else is there? Oh, the skate one is probably the most problematic in terms of finding the skate and, and catching them and landing them safely. And then mm -hmm. um, there's a few different techniques that they'll use. The skate scientists can explain, but doesn't involve much surgery. It's more of like a, an implant on the, the tail or the dorsal as well mm -hmm. that eventually falls off. Mm -hmm. So those are just, that's an overview. And Fred is years more experience doing it than I would, but. Mm -hmm. So to come back to the procedures, Tommy, they're very rigorously controlled. Anybody who's tagging an animal has been trained in animal welfare techniques and in taking care of the animals. Um, anybody who's doing surgery on it has been veterinary and trained up to, to do this, does it under aseptic procedures, can't, can't have sterile. The only thing that's sterile is dead. 
Uh, yeah. So what we do is control the infections uh, and antiseptics that are used to, to swab and do things. And the only way that the animals can be treated to have a good success rate is to treat them really, really well in your handling and care for them. So we find minimally invasive mechanisms by which to, to capture them. For example, for salmon smolts that are heading out to the oceans, instead of capturing them in nets or other things, now there's a new technique called the smolt wheel that is basically, it looks kind of like a cement mixer that's floating in the water with its cement mixer cut in half and it's got baffles welded in it and as it faces upstream huh. it rotates and what happens is the smolts <laughs> that are going down in that path of water are picked up in the baffle scooped up and dropped comfortably into a dark container full of river water that's cool and, and comfortable so that there's no stress to them at all and when they we come up to the uh, time of marking them tagging them to do this they're in great shape and they're anesthetized you do a, a small surgery to insert the tags sew them back up again and turn them out and we also have to remember that the natural world is a hard world for these animals. 99% mm. of everything that lives in the ocean has been eaten by something else. And it doesn't necessarily get eaten the first time. They get crunched <laughs> uh, on numerous <laughs> occasions, right? You see all the scar scars and, and things that are on them. So they have a, a tremendous and strong healing capability and recovery capability. Mm -hmm. So we're cognizant of all of these particular factors. And the people who are involved in this don't get involved in this because they're going to get rich doing this one. This is a labor of love and they love the animals and they, they take really good care of these animals. And they know that in doing this, the kinds of information that these animals are going to give us back is going to contribute to all the other things that we've discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. So really, really important to respect all of these norms and, and we've punched up our animal care game tremendously. Yes, but, uh, that, that, but then it seems like um, it's, it feels to me like there's a lost opportunity for, and I, 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 I understand that you need to highly train professionals, but then, you know, let's say example of skates, right? If, if charter skippers, for example, who are routinely taking people to target and try to catch skate would be able to be part of a program and then tag those skates, then potentially you could put much, much many, many more tags out there rather than, you know, because I'm wondering like, how, how does that, how does that work? You get, you, you taking group of trained people, you putting them on the charter boat and you go out fishing for a skate. Is that how it works? So this is what I'm trying That's to work out. Model. Yeah. The hybrid model is you, you let the anglers do what they do best, which is angling, bring the animals in rapidly. Then you turn them over to the people who've trained to do the tagging and then you put them back in the water again. And that's a good model. That's worked in multiple places of the world. Okay. Okay. And that's, that does have an element in this project with the skate research that Queens are doing. Uh-huh. Can, so you, can, not, you, can, can just... you elaborate on that? So are there <laughs> charter skippers that are part of that program? No, I think, I think part of what they're doing is uh, putting out guidance uh, for anglers to follow and, and mm -hmm. asking them eventually to help tag when the time's right. Um, so, I mean, you could do a whole episode on this, the flapper skate and, and that element of the project, mm -hmm. but it's not simply a case of the scientists going out this project uh, alone and tagging everything themselves. Uh, yes, you know, exactly. The, the, the acoustic ta tags, yes, mm -hmm. scientific, as Fred yeah. said, with all the proper licenses and animal welfare in place. But there's a, a recognition that anglers will land these. There's skate festivals in Clue Bay annually and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that's where our scientists will be going down to liaise and, and discuss these things with the fishing communities, the mm -hmm. anglers. Gotcha, gotcha. So it's like so a there's an educational model. side to it as well. Yeah. Oh, it's good to hear. What, one of the interesting things of the hybrid model, Tony, um, Tommy, is that it lets us say something about the effects of catch and release fishing as well as the general ecology of the animal afterwards. Please, so yes. You as, yeah, so you as an angler have brought this animal up. What happens when we put it back? Does it survive or does it just mm. not? And so when, certainly a lot of our work, for example, tagging blue sharks has been done through the recreational angling industry. We've captured the animals and we've been able to come back and show really, really high survival rates following the release of these animals as they go back into the ocean. So you can do yeah. similar things will happen with salmon and with the skates. Right, right. That's, that's good. That's, that's good. Okay. So what else? So maybe, maybe now you can, you can kind of open up on the actual technology and, and, uh, and, and all the, all the net networks and how, how does that work? Okay. Well, we certainly covered, yeah, we certainly covered bits and pieces of it. My network, the Ocean Tracking Network, is actually global. 
in its mm. reach. So we, we've got much of North America covered from the tropics all the way up into the Arctic at this point in time on both sides of the coast. We've expanded with nodes down into Brazil and we're on the uh, Pacific coast of South America as well. More patchy there, but we're beginning to, to expand out, moving into the Pacific Islands. Um, Australia has got a node that is the homegrown node that we've integrated through the data systems mm -hmm. that we work with. And we've got a pretty big network down in South Africa that's punching up along wow. the coast of Africa into uh, both the Atlantic and into the Indian Ocean side of these things. So we're a little wow. weak in Asia at this point in time. But th these are the investigators that are coming online. They're using common technologies, which enables us to make this exchange of, of information back and forth very, very easily. And mm -hmm. we are detecting some fantastic long distance movements of, of animals. Um, one that antedated my network was a famous case of a white shark that was tagged in South Africa. Mm -hmm. It was in a place called False Bay. Yeah. And it had been seen there in previous years. And everybody said, yeah, it's a resident of False Bay. So it was tagged uh, four months previously. And they saw it again four months later at the end of the summer and said, yep, still here. But in between, this animal swam to Australia and came back again. <laughs> and all of that was picked up on this special satellite tag that it had on board it. And mm -hmm. it, it had some interesting implications for, for, for example, international policy. At one point in time, the, they had a fatal shark attack in Perth, Australia, in that mm -hmm. region. And the local um, premier decided that he was going to institute a shark kill to try <laughs> to reduce the risk of this. And the South Africans brought a diplomatic complaint because they said, well, that could be a South African shark. And we depend on those South African sharks for our cage driving industry here, where people are spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year to go mm -hmm. see the sharks in places along South Africa. So this is how it begins to play out. Mm, that's, yeah, they're that's not a, our sharks for our yeah. species. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so, so you reach is like a, across the world. So is, are these like a, I'm trying just to imagine as these like a stations where is your equipment there with the, with the, you know, ocean tracking network logo on them or like, how does that work? I'm just yeah, trying to big, paint a picture. Uh, yeah. That's basically the, uh, the picture. If you want to get a map of it, we do have a website, ocean tracking network.org mm -hmm. that you could just look it up and see and, and get a picture of this one. But currently I, per my organization itself personally deploys about 2000 receivers on an annual basis. Um, we're networking with a network of up to 25,000 additional receivers that are out in different parts of the ocean. So that's mm -hmm. what gives us this global reach, this ability to, to do this. And that's why it's so critical to be able to exchange data amongst all of those 25,000 different moorings that are out there. Then you throw into the mix the marine autonomous vehicles that Ross was mentioning. I've got 12 of them that we, we have out in the different times. They're mobile receiver platforms that are listening for these animals. We're putting these receiver units on other autonomous vehicles elsewhere in the world, to Florida, other, other places like that, so that they're providing additional detections in places where we can't hope to put a mooring either because it's too costly or it won't survive the draggers that mm -hmm. are doing fishing in those regions. And then we've even enlisted some gray seals to help out. And the way this one works is we've got a, a special receiver unit that has a Bluetooth capability on it. And mm -hmm. what it does is it listens for tagged fish that, that are out in the water. And when it detects one, it transmits it via Bluetooth to the satellite tag that's on the head of the gray seal. And then <laughs> they sends it down to us via satellite to let us know that the gray seal has been in a, a place where we find these other species. And we found that the gray seals have been interacting with tuna, with sharks, with cod, with other things, not eating the cod. They're gathering in the same places that the cod are gathering to feed on the little silverfish that huh. everybody likes to, to feed on at the time. So that begins to help inform you about the uh, the management measures you should be taking. Should, be, should you be killing seals that are not feeding on cod because you're afraid they might be feeding on cod? Probably not. Mm, that's, 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 that's great. Yeah. Uh, huh. Fantastic. Listen, and, and so d tell me more about these autonomous vehicles. How they, it's, 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 I'm, I'm just uh, speechless. <laughs> Mind blowing stuff. Yes. 
So there we have we another just, website that you could take a look at least on our a fleet that I operate. It's called Sea Otter, which is actually spelled C E O T R. Okay. I forget what the acronym stands for. It's mm -hmm. pronounced Sea Otter. But anyway, you can look that one up if you want to, and it will show you tell you something about the vehicles. There's the Everyone's Glider organization in Europe as well. It's got mm -hmm. a great website that explains how things work. But the idea behind the autonomous vehicles is that they are cost efficient technologies. So they're they're not like a ship that a an expensive ship to do telemetry work for me would cost me twenty five thousand euros a day to, to put it out into the ocean. That's a little too much for a research project to maintain. By contrast, for one to two hundred dollars a day, I can keep one of these autonomous vehicles out patrolling areas that will happily cope with uh, waves that are 10 to 20 meters high and will continue to, to detect data and it brings it up via satellite or cell phone networks if it's within range of cell phones in the coastline and will send us our, our information. So we use these for a variety of different things. But not only do they tag or sorry, follow track animals that have tags on them, but they're also measuring environmental conditions. So mm -hmm. we have two types of gliders. One sits only on the surface, which can tell you a lot about the temperature of the surface, what's the oxygen level on the surface, other things that are important to the animals, what the chlorophyll levels are, the plant production, which is telling you something about whether it's a really productive area or not. But we also have di diving gliders that will go down and come back up again to the surface. And they are listening for tagged animals the whole time, but they're telling you how deep is it before you get into the cold layers down mm -hmm. here. Um, where is the oxygen minimum? And it is the oxygen levels getting down to the point that it's a problem for animals to survive it? Those, those kinds of information can be transmitted back. Or do the animals show a particular preference? I'm only going to go to areas where the temperature and the oxygen are at levels that I want to be at. And other mm. places of the ocean that seem at first glance to be perfectly suitable are not suitable because they're not in that optimal range that the right. animals are actually choosing at the time. So we need to know all those kinds of things. So these autonomous vehicles do that. And the third thing that we train them to do is for some of our classes of receivers, we have equipped them. They're moored down on the bottom for six to eight years at a time. And we don't mm -hmm. touch them at that point, but we need to get our data back from them. They have acoustic modems on board that can broadcast the information. And you can do that with a ship that costs $25,000 a day, or you can do that with a glider that costs $100 a day to go out and do it. So we've trained our gliders to go out and harvest our data from <laughs> many of our lines that are out there. And we, uh, we pay undergraduate students to pilot them. Um, they sit back with a Starbucks coffee in a, in a computer room in their, uh, their, their, their living room sort of thing. And they don't have to go up and down in the waves and the university doesn't have to worry about them drowning and everybody's happy. <laughs> it's a great how video did, game. Yeah. And how did, how, how did that, how the idea came up, came, came about? So was it, because obviously you're, you're, you're engaged with a lot of universities and, and, and scientific uh, uh, units who actually do these things, right? Build those gliders and probably they're using machine learning models to train them to, to, do whether they need to do and, and all, all that. So it's, it's like a massive amount of work that happened before even first glider went into the water and harvest any data, right? Yeah, well, oceanography drove it. Oceanography is Ocean. a very expensive science. You need the big vessels to do that. Um, some, some countries have been slow in replacing oceanographic vessels. And so one of the imperatives has been the fact that we don't have the capacity that we used to, to do the oceanographic research that we used to be able to do. Mm -hmm. So if you can start to fill these gaps with these autonomous vehicles, then that becomes a, a very important consideration. The second is the cost effectiveness. We need to provide the, uh, the value for the money that's out there and ships can do multiple missions and they're very important. For example, search and rescue is a ship operation. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the ship is doing oceanography and suddenly it gets a call and it has to go off and do search and rescue. And at that time you stop doing your science, but you've lost the critical science information mm -hmm. that you need at that particular point in time. So we can't do search and rescue with the autonomous vehicles so they can get devoted to this and we'll make sure mm -hmm. you don't get holes in your data. So there's another important consideration surrounding this, but the, the cost is, is always a consideration. And if you think about weather forecasting, mm -hmm. um, the number of weather stations that we have, in Ireland, in Europe, on land, here in North America. 
um, comparatively speaking, we've got less than one one thousandth of that coverage mm -hmm. for the ocean, for understanding ocean conditions right now. So we're not going to get to the point that we'll be able to build those kinds of weather monitoring stations everywhere in the ocean, but we can greatly increase our coverage and knowledge of the ocean by the use of these kinds of gliders. And one of the places where they've been really, really important, and they've had big and measurable impacts has been in storm forecasting and the intensity of storms. Yeah. So we know that hurricanes these and the, some of the storms that have been hitting Europe even now are picking up their energy from a hot ocean. And understanding how much energy they're picking up greatly improves our ability to predict what kind of damage it's going to do. Should we be evacuating people from coastal areas because the storm surge is going to be much bigger than we had before? And without having the information about the sea surface temperatures, you can't make those predictions accurately. And by getting the gliders out, we've been Increase these by 10, 20, 30 percent, the accuracy of the predictions, depending on the areas where they've gone into. Huh. It's been big, big benefit to coastal communities to, to have this information. Right. So it's not only wildlife, it's not only sea life, it's also all the stuff. And is, so are you guys like constantly working on actually having more and more of these gliders and autonomic vehicles across the, across the world? Is your, is your goal ultimately to have a, you know, like a one in every part of the world all the time? Is, is this kind of what, what part of it? I'm certainly working on, on that level. Um, we don't have a, a systemic program similar to, for example, the United States, the NOAA group has got a really big glider program and they work in collaboration with the U.S. Navy and they're the ones who are maintaining the ongoing monitoring and, and missions that are providing huge amount of information and buoys as well that they'll put out in the ocean, different mm -hmm. places to maintain the mooring that are providing very, very valuable information to the global community about oceanographic conditions. And, and this is being used not only for storm forecasting, but for example, for monsoon prediction. Mm -hmm. So it's so, so important to understand whether they're going to be rains and how big they're going to be in places in Africa. Um, it could be the difference between having a, a successful agricultural season or famine for parts of, of Africa at those particular times. So, so knowing in advance what the situation is going to be and what we should be prepared for is really, really important. So NOAA has mm -hmm. been carrying a disproportionate share of the load globally. Um, now we're trying to, to pick up some of the slack and help them out and get all of this data. And the community that does this kind of operating is making their data accessible universally to anybody. They, they upload it through the, uh, a system called the Global Telecommunication System, GTS, where it becomes rapidly available on a first blush. That hasn't been quality assured, quality controlled at that point in time, but it's, it's sometimes you just need the information right now. For example, as a hurricane is working its way up the coastline. Yeah. But afterwards, what happens is the data will all be processed. Um, anomalies will be cleaved out of it. If things are wrong, they just take it away. And sometimes glitches happen in electronics, just the mm -hmm. way electronics work. And then what you do is you archive it through National Ocean Data Centers, and then it's made available to the global community for, for free use. So this has been a huge international success story. Right. And so you mentioned about the data and being, so is it stored like a centrally? Do you have like a central data center that kind of gets all the data from all those various, you know, uh, gliders and tags and acoustics and everything? It all goes into one place and then people are kind of processing that, cleaning up the data and so on? It goes into national ocean data centers. So each country will maintain its own particular system uh -huh. here, in, here in Canada. Um, Formerly, it was the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Right now, we're working on developing something called the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing Systems. Mm -hmm. Globally, there's a global ocean observing system that feeds, get, takes feeds of data up from the various national authorities. In the U.S., it's the Integrated Ocean Observing System that's present. The Europeans have got, got equivalents for this. But that has been organized to try to move this data and provide the quality assurance quality control and also to begin to measure the new things that need to be measured as new new changes or new threats begin to come down through the uh yeah through the changes that are occurring to our ocean. and as you can imagine this project has a very big data management component to it which will feed yeah. into those systems as as data comes in and is processed used by the scientists for whatever the project needs it'll then be made public at some level through those systems that fred alluded to so that you know, yeah. the, the hope is that at the end of the project, or along the way, rather, you'll be able to see through a website or through a, something like the Digital Ocean, which Marine Institute run 
a platform that can display the oceanographic layers, the mm -hmm. salmon smolt detections in your area, the, mm -hmm. the seal movements for that year from the juvenile seals that have been tagged, uh, the, occur the cetacean occurrences and that sort of thing. So, you know, you're, you're involving the public and other academics and scientists who want to learn from it, you know, to get papers out of it, to, to push the research forward. Right, right. No, I mean, like uh, the, the, the like, you, like you mentioned, the data management part of that is 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 mind-boggling because uh, you, you have these, uh, yeah. And would it would you like to see this ultimately coming into one place and and kind of being able to aggregate all that data, or or is it you know like a kind of political aspects of it are just you know insurmountable and they have to be kind of segregated by country or by administrative area. No, federation is the way to go. Um, different jurisdictions are going to have different rules, especially privacy rules and uh, regulations about where you can and cannot store national data. Mm -hmm. So the, the key is to, to have all of these centers linked, similar to what we described for the Ocean Tracking Network's data system, so that I can go and harvest data from all of these things and federate it my, or aggregate it myself to meet the particular need for the particular model that I need to, to operate. Mm -hmm. So I, that's the way the world's working, and it makes a lot of sense to do it that way. It also is a source of national pride for each one of these countries. You can actually see what mm -hmm. you have done and how you are making a contribution to things on a, on a global basis. And every nation needs to stand back and take, take credit and pride in what they've accomplished in doing those kinds of things. Oh, that's very that's a very good point actually that's a very good point uh well, I, I have one other question about these uh tagless uh, kind of uh, how 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 the uh, you know whales and other you know purpose monitoring works where you don't actually have a tag you you i presume you you getting like some sort of an echo generated by these animals and then you can analyze that and and based on that you're figuring out what size or sort of animal is that or or how does that work when when i first met fred i'm, I'm just introducing this to what he's going to describe when you talk about mind-blowing stuff for science nerds and people who are really into this first met fred I, I asked him a question like well what do you do with all this data like or what you know how do you collect it what do you do and he popped up his laptop to show me the, the website that displays the right whale information that they garner from this I'll let Fred pick it up there, but I mean, yeah. it is incredible where you can, you know, to get to the stage where you can almost in real time use this technology to see where right whales are in your waters to protect them and help is incredible. So the acoustic tags we use to tag fish. We use acoustics because acoustics carry for relatively long distances in water. That's, that's why we do that. Radio waves won't carry, so you got to use acoustics. Marine animals have figured this out, and there are a lot of different kinds of marine animals that make noises for a variety of different purposes. Drums, for example, down in the Gulf of Mexico, it's a signal that they use to indicate spawning aggravations, and now's the time, everybody. Come on, let's group spawn, sort of thing. In the case of the marine mammals, they've got a couple of different classes of mammals that are making different kinds of sounds. So you have your baleen whales that will make calls, the song that Ross described, um, low frequency rumbles and grunts and, and, and chats sort of thing. Then you have other animals like a sperm whale that are clicking mm -hmm. and putting them down again in, in low frequency. But these calls and the frequencies that the animals make noise on are all characteristic of the particular species. So what it means is that you can actually have a passive hydrophone put in the water listening for these gigantic acoustic tags that are making different noises of different kinds. And where, where we could get to is the point that we can identify the species of them. We're not down to the point yet, although we hope that we'll get there eventually, that we'll be able to identify individuals based on the sound of their voices uh, wow. afterwards in the ocean, which would be really kind of cool. But where we are now is we can identify species. And as Ross is mentioning, we've got a major crisis here in North America with our right whales. The population has declined to now under 500 individuals. Whoa. Um, the, very recently, the ocean changed massively, and the right whales have had to change their distributions because the places that used to generate food for them are no longer generating food. And all of our management measures that were designed to keep them safe in those particular feeding areas immediately broke down. And in one year, we had 17 of these animals killed. And they were killed because they got tangled in fishing gear primarily, or they got tangled, uh, or, uh, hit by ships. 
Those were the two big, big causes of mortality, and that was because they moved from the Bay of Fundy up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and they're still changing their distribution as we speak. So we're on an emergency missions right now to try to understand where are these animals right now, this day, mm -hmm. and are there ships around there or are there fishing gear around there, and do we need to take emergency measures to try to reduce wow. the risk of entanglement or of killing these animals. And one of the ways that we're doing that is by this passive acoustic monitoring, by having our gliders up with these hydrophones and they're listening. And every few hours they come to the surface and they download whether they heard right whales or ba other baleen whales mm -hmm. calls at the time. And that lets the managers make a decision. We're also got the, uh, airplanes up in the air and they're overflying the areas trying to look, but those don't work when it's really wavy or when there's fog mm -hmm. in the areas. And there wow. is some hope that maybe we could do some of this stuff from satellites as well, but the whales spend most of their time underwater, not up on the surface. And yeah. as a consequence, it's something like a glider listening for, for calls is helpful. The problem is the animals aren't calling all the time yeah. as well. So, yeah. so no yeah. one technology is good enough to, to answer the questions and help us. We just got to get enough out there to try to help us through. So this is all passive. So you're not actually actively. Okay. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, how are you fixed for time? Do we have still a little bit time? I can keep going for a bit. I'm okay, okay. too. Yeah. All right. That's, 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 that's perfect. Um, so you mentioned, uh, Fred, that uh, ocean has changed rapidly recently. What's mm -hmm. the, what's the, is it climate change? Is it what sort of change is that? That's certainly part of it. Um, they, the heat that we're putting into the atmosphere is having some, some pretty strange impacts, and we're still trying to, to figure out what these are and, and what are they going to mean over time. It's not quite simply that northern areas are getting warmer, although that they are, and they're certainly doing that on land. But the ocean circulation is much more complex. Arctic water flows from the north down towards the south. We've got warm water, and, and that's down deep. The warm water from the south flows up towards the north. And in that Gulf Stream in particular, things are happening that are indicating it's to some degree destabilizing. And it's beginning to do things like spin off something called an eddy. So th imagine a chunk of this, this Gulf Stream that's coming up and it suddenly breaks off and it forms a, a gigantic donut. And the currents inside it are circul circling around and around and around. And that gigantic donut gets pushed on the surface winds and it might get pushed into the shoreline. And suddenly I'll go for a swim here off of Halifax. And instead of being surrounded by the Arctic to subarctic animals that are normally here, I've got amberjacks and I've got seahorses that wow. are all in the, the coastline at, at that particular time. And, and that Gulf Stream is becoming more and more squirrely in that way. We're generating many more eddies and they're, they're cropping up in areas that we didn't expect as well as sort of systemic focus, our changes of temperature so that we're seeing warm water animals penetrating farther north than they ever did and the, the cooler animals are going farther north and the northern animals have nowhere to go. They got, yeah. they, they're up against the, the wall there. So all of these kinds of changes are, are happening due to temperature. And then once it warms up because of the temperature, you reduce the... Uh, ability of the water to dissolve oxygen yes you cannot do that so at that point in time you got another problem and we've got big areas where through a combination of water warming and other kinds of pollution notably nutrients that are causing algae blooms that mm -hmm. are causing big deoxygenated zones that are, are proving fatal to a large number of marine animals and and mm -hmm. taking habitat that used to be good for producing fish and invertebrates and shutting it off so it's not producing anything outside of a small class of of oxygen and tolerant uh, to of worms that are tolerant of low levels of oxygen gotcha. and that's it down gotcha. in those those areas so so these are the kinds of changes that are that are occurring but you you reckon they 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 they're is there a natural component to these changes or they're just too rapid and too odd and they're just purely, you know, driven by human activity? Now, I'm one of the, the people whose gliders are out there measuring the changes and they're happening too fast to be, be driven through natural changes. I'm, you know, the, the, the jury is, is clear. It's the science is there. It's showing that we are in a period where human activities have caused a series of changes. Right, right. Wow, um, that's that's a that's a good kind of moment to pivot into into another question. I would like to ask, and you partially already answered that the the changes we see in the environment in general and in the ocean are not positive. And what's your what's your view on that? Is there is there a hope? Is there 
do, do you see any any positive changes or any positive moves or is it a matter of just brace for impact Ross, I've been doing a lot of talking. You want to go first? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I've been thinking about this one a lot because, um, again, coming at it from more of a um, political policy mm -hmm. point of view rather than the science, because Fred's very clear, as he said, about the science that's coming through. So how do you train, translate that into action? And we're at an interesting point because we are certainly feeling the effects of it now more directly. And the... The, the humans on the planet, I mean, are feeling it just as much as the, the other species uh, on this globe. So yet there are still a lot of deniers and you have, um, but you have a, a, the, the young people and there's a movement that accept it's happening. But what do you do to start making that change? Mm -hmm. Balancing the, the, like Fred said, the coastal communities that are under, you know, how do you get them to see the sense or change their position on it? And there will not be one answer to it. Um, working collaboratively with projects like this is definitely the way forward because I think most people agree that you have to base things on sound science. That's a starting point, right? If we can all agree to follow the science. Hmm. How do you get the balance then with, um, take any of the issues like um, salmon and angling. Hmm. Um, should it be catch and release only? Should we stop angling? Uh, uh, you know, should we just have farm? Uh, mm -hmm. salmon you've covered that in previous episodes but what are the implications on that do you know what i mean every everything we do has a knock-on effect yeah. so it's easy to sit here and spout off all these things we should be doing um mm -hmm. that would be a very you know ludicrous of me or fred to suggest those things um you know certainly we need to reduce um co2 emissions um how do you start doing that which, which sector would you like to pick off and how would you like to do it? Is it transport? Mm -hmm. is, it, mm -hmm. is it domestic energy? You know, what sort of things, you know, yeah. <laughs> you have to start somewhere and you have to start with good policy that recognizes the problem first, that there yeah. is a problem and it's not, it's not a, a figment of our imagination or it's not a natural cycle. Mm -hmm. Those things do happen, but this is way beyond that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Once you do that, then you start to create policies that, can get you to the goals of zero emissions, you know, carbon neutral society, that sort of thing. Yeah. But I, I don't know what, I mean, yeah. Fred. <laughs> the core of the problem is that change is hard. And whenever mm. change occurs, there are always going to be winners and they're going to be losers in that. And losers um, don't, don't, want to lose. <laughs> they're they're yeah. going to fight back and try to, to, to resist something changing that's going to take away their livelihood or, or, or in other ways harm their, their way of life. And mm -hmm. that's just the nature of how human beings are. So yeah, policy is, is great, but when we've begun to force changes that are going to be laying out irrespective of what we do now over the next 10, 20, 30 years, and we're just mm -hmm. going to be in for a wild ride at this yeah. point. So part of what we can hope to do is provide an understanding of what these changes are going to need so these communities can brace themselves for yeah. what that's going to mean. Is there going to be more storms? Are there going to be more heat waves? Are there going to be fewer lobsters? Are there going to be more <laughs> tuna? Okay. Uh, exactly how is this going to change? And then try to come up with some way of getting ahead of the curve on this one and provide a rational and intelligent management system and policy system so that people can adapt to this and so that we can preserve the things that everybody wants to preserve yeah that's a that's a that's a good that's a good that's a good answer um, but overall are you remain optimistic i am hopelessly optimistic okay good to hear about, about things now i i know things some things are going to change to the degree that um that w we may never go back we may never ever, ever get salmon back in the southern distribution of its range here in North America, not just because of the warming that's occurring now, but because of all of the dams and all of the introduced exotic species that are predators on them and all the, the rest of these kinds of, of things. But that doesn't mean that I can't keep salmon in this world as a, a important species, one that's iconic, one that, that we can point to and say, isn't it wonderful that we have this wonderful species in our, 
our particular world. So yeah, from that perspective, I'm, I'm not expecting that everything is going to stay exactly the same and there will be mm-hmm. no change at, at no particular point in time, but going to maintain the essentials and going to yeah. do that because I've got kids and I'm going to have grandkids and all of that mm-hmm. is great. Okay, that's 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 good to hear. I, I I always when you know when inevitably we start talking about you know ocean and destruction and all that it all goes down. It's like oh very very pessimistic. So I'm glad that you kind of <laughs> lifted mood a little bit with your with your optimism. Uh, so that's good to hear, uh, gentlemen. Is there anything else that you wish I asked or covered but I didn't? Yeah, I got a question for you, Tommy. Please. I've heard this mentioned on a number of occasions. Have yes. you ever been to the Clue Bay Skate Festival? And what really goes on at the Clue Bay Skate Festival? I, w- I didn't. I didn't. Unfortunately, I, I can't answer you that question. But I might find, uh, you know, okay. I can homework find people. You. That's your homework. You are going to yeah. go to the Clue Bay Skate Festival. I, I smell a live, a live broadcast, a live podcast from yes. the Clue Bay yeah. Skate Festival. Fantastic. That's a, that's a very good idea. That's a very good idea. And, and I'm sorry that I <laughs> kind of let you down here, but I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of uh, not a type of festival goer person. <laughs> so I'm kind of doing things on my own. <laughs> but that's a good idea. That's a good idea. And I will try to find the information about that. And uh, I can contact you after that and let you know what's going on there. Mm. That'll, be, that'll be good. Okay, um, so for everybody who is listening to this podcast and is absolutely, you know, marvels at what you guys doing, and, and is, is there any way you, you regular folks or anglers or people who just who just want to help, is there any way uh, they can support you? Uh, you know, either through volunteer work or through financially or, or any, 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 any way possible? Well, I don't think we're looking for financial support, although that would, that does sound nice, but we have um, a little donate button gen- somewhere. <laughs> There's no donate button with C monitor. Um, yeah. As a government funded uh, project. But we, we do have, you found us through Twitter, and that's probably the best way to keep up to date with the project. And you can subscribe um, through our website, uh, which is if you just Google C Monitor Locks Agency or C Monitor, you'll come up to our, our webpage mm-hmm. and you can find out and keep up to date with the project that way. We also have an easy that you can subscribe to um, because, as I say, there's other marine research projects, sister projects, we call them, that we're working with, and they're looking at different aspects. So there's another project that's being led by AFI called Compass, which is more oceanographic focused, but also has Mm -hmm. salmon elements from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And there's a MARPAM uh, project, so you can find out more about those. There's a lot going on, as well as Fred's website, oceantracking.org. Is that right, Fred? Oceantrackingnetwork.org. Oceantrackingnetwork.org, so you can can find out about what's happening there and all the partners in the partnership. So that would be be a good starting place. And um, we'll be running events both for the academic side of stuff, but also for the general public and, and people with an interest like yourself, Tommy, as as things happen. And we should be doing some press releases soon on the, the salmon detections um, in the North Channel that have um, that's quite interesting. So you'll hear about us in the autumn coming out with that sort of stuff. Yeah. I have a one other question. I have a one other question. And that question is like, is, are these projects, uh, you know, both sea monitor and, and ocean tracking, are they kind of like open-ended and you will go forever and ever, or at least as long as possible, or is it kind of like a time bound effort and you're doing that for, you know, six years, 10 years, and then it's over. Yeah. I should have said the nuts and bolts at the start We're we started last year and we're due to finish the end of December, 2022. At the mm-hmm. moment. So they are time bound, um, but like all science, you know, it, it builds on on previous projects and continues to build in the future. So, um, although the sea monitor may end at that time, I'm sure there'll be other projects emerging because of all the things that we learn from sea monitor and the other projects, um, and that we need to expand and expand on and maintain. You know. Gotcha. Gotcha. Threads and will it- continue. I'm sure. Much. Much. You're more core funded Fred and, and into the future. Yes, I'm what's called the National Science Facility. So as long as there is a need on the international community's basis and we're producing productive work and meeting these needs, then we will be up for renewal on an ongoing basis every five years. 
All right, all right. Yeah, I, I, I would imagine that you're, you know, you're. I, I can't, I can't imagine a scenario where the work that you're doing would, wouldn't be necessary anymore. I, it seems like it's going to be more and more necessary as we go along. So, listen, listen, folks. Uh, thank you very much for your time. It's been uh, mind blowing, quite frankly. Uh, I, I probably need a quiet minute for myself to digest everything that I learned and everything that I heard. So thank you so much for your time and for sharing with me and our listeners um, what you have shared. And uh, I wish you uh, all the best for the future. And thanks, thanks a lot. Thank My great time. pleasure.